Welcome to TV African News and thank you so much for joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Nahabu Kajura and in the headlines. Give Africa two permanent seats on UN Security Council, Museveni demands. The National Resistance Movement adjusts up for 36th anniversary. And Gambia's borough sworn in for the second presidential term. In a sports today, AFCON 2021, a round of fixtures completed. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We start with one of our top stories. Now, President Yuri Kagutam Seveni has demanded that Africa is given two permanent seats on the UN Security Council and should be reformed to favor all people that inhabit the planet Earth. Now, the Ugandan president said these African representatives would take positions given to them by the African Union and not their own individual positions. We have more on this report. Speaking at the ninth ministerial level meeting of the African Union Committee of Heads of State and Government on the reform of the United Nations Security Council at Mnyonyo on Thursday, Museven said Africa needs to be fully represented at all the UN organs, including the Security Council. The president reminded his audience that in 2005, the African Union appointed members of the committee of 10 heads of state and government with the mandate to advocate and converse for the African common position on the reform of the United Nations Security Council, and it was also agreed that Africa gets two permanent seats on the Security Council, with two veto rights, two more non-permanent seats on the Council, and that it is African Union to appoint the African representatives. He said that Africa must be in that Security Council to ensure that it is not used negatively against Africa, and that it is instead used positively for Africa and the rest of the world. Making a case for a two permanent seat with veto powers on the UN Security Council, Museven said that in the past, the UN system has been misused to commit aggression against Africa. He cited the murder of DRC's Patrice Lumumba in 1961 and the attack on Libya as two incidents in which the UN was used against Africa, noting that the latter led to the chaos in Mali, Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, whereas Congo has been in successive problems in the last 60 years. Museven, however, noted that using the size of the economy, among other key factors, to determine permanent representatives on new Security Council is wrong, adding that there should be fair representation by all continents. The Security Council is one of the six principal organs of the United Nations charged with ensuring international peace and security, recommending the admission of new UN members to the General Assembly and approving any charges to the UN Charter. The Security Council consists of 15 members, five of which are permanent, including China, France, Russia, Britain, Northern Ireland, and United States of America. Thank you so much, our reporter. Moving on in our top story, celebrations to mark 36 years since NRM took power will be held under strict COVID-19 SOPs, according to the Minister of State for Economic Monitoring, Peter Ogwang. The Minister of State for Economic Monitoring, Peter Ogwang, said that only 547 people are expected to attend the main do at Kololo ceremonial grounds. He said the celebrations will be held under the theme celebrating the 36th NRM Victory Day, a call to duty for all compatriots to continue towards Uganda's social economic transformation journey. Before the main celebrations, there will be Thanksgiving prayers on January 21st, 2022, and 23rd for Muslims, Adventists, and other Christians, respectively. He urged invited guests to be at the venue by 9 a.m. before the guest of honor, President Museven, arrives, lest they will be turned away. NRM Liberation Day is a national holiday in Uganda, observed on January 26th each year. The holiday marks the overthrow of the previous government by the National Resistance Movement on this day in 1986. Away from that, the government of Uganda revises new COVID-19 testing measures for fuel truck drivers at various borders to mitigate the increased fuel scarcity and its increased prices across the country. We have more on this report. 
While addressing the press today at the Uganda Media Center, the Minister of ICT and National Guidance, Honorable Chris Bariomonsi said, despite the Health Ministry's order for mandatory COVID testing for all truck drivers entering the country from various border points, which forced the drivers into a protest that led to low fuel supply, the ministers of the East African community agreed that laboratories be mounted across the region to test COVID-19 and results be accepted across the East African region. The minister said that every truck driver with the results acquired in the last 14 days of testing together with passengers be allowed to proceed and are not subjected to any other tests. Earlier on, the ministers of the East African community and those of health had met and made some agreement as the sub-region of East Africa where one, they had made an assessment of laboratories in the region and accredited several laboratories in the region that would carry out COVID testing and the results should be acceptable across the region. Up to 66 laboratories were assessed and approved and I think in Uganda we have up to 22 laboratories which had been approved. So that if a test is carried out by a laboratory in Uganda that has been approved then the results should be accepted across in Kenya and Tanzania and South Sudan. That arrangement had already been arrived at. The ministers had also agreed uh, that we accept results which have been given in the last 14 days. The Honorable Minister also added that they resolved that all truck drivers who requires to be tested should be tested and the Ugandan government will meet the costs of the tests. Done as a government in a bid to resolve the impasse which had been created by the truck drivers is that we have now harmonized as a region to say that the truck drivers and all their passengers who reach the border points with the negative PCR results that have been given in the last 14 days be allowed to proceed, should not be subjected to another test. Secondly, we also agreed that if there is a truck driver or any other passenger they are carrying who requires to be tested, he or she should be tested at the border. But the cost shall be met by the government of Uganda. The minister finally commended that with all these measures, the fuel trucks have started their entrance into the country. But however, the minister cautioned fuel business performers to return to normal fuel prices and not being so exorbitant to consumers. Well, thank you so much, our reporter Kachanchu. Africa Today takes a quick break. We shall come back with the international news. Welcome back from the break. You're still watching TV Africa, the right to know. In an international news today, Kivu Watt, a company extracts gas from the lake's waters for electricity using the enormous concentrations of potentially explosive gases within Chivu, one of Africa's great rift lakes lying between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our reporter has more. According to Francois Dachambu from Chivu Watt, a company that extracts gas from the lake's waters for electricity, flanked by rolling green hills tumbling into glassy waters, Chivu is not quite the picture of tranquility, it seems. Thousands of years of volcanic activity has caused a massive accumulation of the methane and carbon dioxide to dissolve in the depths of Chivu, enough to prove monumentally destructive in the rare event they were released. If triggered, a so-called limnic eruption would cause a huge explosion of gas from deep waters to the surface resulting in large waves and a poisonous gas cloud that would put the lives of millions at risk, according to Dachambu, the environmental manager at Chivu Wat. Only three such lakes exist in the world, Chivu and Lake Nyos and more known in northwest Cameroon. 
The latter two experienced limnic eruptions in the 1980s, and the bigger disaster at News suffocated more than 1,700 people in a toxic release of carbon dioxide. The Chambu say that these catastrophes occurred in a rural area, whereas some 2 million people would be at risk of such a similar disaster involving Chivu. In both Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, many live in fear of the lake's harmful potential, and stories abound of swimmers disappearing into its depth after being asphyxiated or pulled under. Moving on in international news, Gambian President Adama Barrow was sworn in for a second term on Wednesday at ceremonies near the capital, Banjul. Now, the former property developer was re-elected in December, winning 53% of the vote. Take a look at the story. Barrow's first election in 2016 put an end to more than 20 years of Yahya Jame's rule over the tiny West African nation. He was sworn in for a second five-year term at the stadium at Bakau on the outskirts of Banjul in ceremonies attended by foreign VIPs that climaxed with a 21-gun salute. December's election was peaceful and marked the first vote in the former British colony of two million people since Jame fled into exile in January 2017 after his surprise defeat at the ballot box. Jame ruled for 22 years, presiding over a regime accused of a litany of abuses, including death squads and torture. The United Democratic Party of leading opposition candidate Ousanu Dabu appealed the election results to the Supreme Court, alleging irregularities and corruption in Barrow's campaign. The plea was dismissed. A Nigerian court on Wednesday ruled that the 2017 arrest of Nandi Kanu, accused of leading a secessionist campaign in the country's southeast, was illegal, but the same court upheld the state's treason charges against Kanu. Take a look at the story. According to a Nigerian court, Kanu's violent arrest in 2017 was an infringement on his rights and ordered the government to pay 2.4 million US dollars. Last year, the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra was extradicted to Nigeria from London where he had fled after being released on bail in 2017. Kanu faces several counts of terrorism and treason, which charges he denies. He is running a campaign on the platform of IPOB for the reawakening of Biafra Republic, a sensation movement that led to a civil war in 1967 to 1970 to bring Southeast back under the control of Abuja. The war caused the death of more than one million people. Nigeria has blamed last year's attack on police and security personnel on Kanu's separatist group, a claim the movement denies. Discontent with Abuja is rife in the southeast over perceived marginalization and abuse by the oil industry. Moving on, a Liberian President George Weir visits victims in hospital after a stampede at an open-air prayer meeting in the capital, Monrovia, killed 29 people, including 11 children and a pregnant woman. Now, on Thursday, he was at the bedside of some of the 15 survivors admitted to the hospital. On Thursday, the death toll of religious gathering that took place overnight between Wednesday and Thursday was provisional. In fact, a number of people were still in critical condition. George Weir commented that it was really a very sad day in their country and tragedy expressed their sympathy of all the families that lost their loved ones. He promised to make sure that those that are having crusade will make sure that if the space is there for 10 people, it should be 10 people. Details about the incident remain sketchy, but according to local media, the prayer gathering, locally known as crusade, was held on a football pitch in New Crew Town. Such a gatherings typically gather thousands of people in Liberia, a highly religious country where a majority of the population of 5 million are Christians. Pastor Abraham Cromer, a popular preacher, staged the two-day prayer event which attracted large crowds according to images circulating on social media. Local media reported that robbers wielding knives and machetes attacked the worshippers and this may have triggered the stampede. A stampede at a similar prayer event in the center of Liberia in November 2021 killed two infants and hospitalized several others according to local media. 
President George Weah declared a three-day period of mourning and ordered an investigation according to his office. Africa Today takes a quick break. We shall come back with the business news. Welcome back from the break as you're watching TV Africa, the right to know. In a business news today, the head of Libya's National Oil Corporation made a rare appearance on Wednesday denouncing a lack of state investment. Mustafa Sanala mentioned dilapidated networks that required regular servicing. If Libya sits on the largest known oil reserves in Africa, it lacks the necessary installations to exploit the natural resource. The powerful head of Libya's National Oil Corporation decried a lack of state investment in the country's energy sector on Wednesday. In a decade of violence since the 2011 revolt that overthrew and killed former leader Muammar Gaddafi, armed groups have frequently blockaded or damaged oil installations and some have been destroyed. In 2021, Libya's lifeline oil and gas exports managed to raise revenues of more than 21.5 billion US dollars in 2021, the highest level in five years. However, a low budget coupled with political instability still keep Libya's economy hostage. The National Oil Corporation seeks to maintain production rates of 1.2 million barrels and has set a plan to increase these numbers if it is able to obtain funds, but without them, maintaining this number is considered an achievement in itself. Injecting money in Libya's energy sector seems vital since the country is heavily dependent on revenues from its oil and gas exports. The World Bank estimated in 2019 that oil rents amounted to 43% of Libya's GDP. In our health news today, Africa's top public health organizations have called for donated COVID-19 vaccines to come with a shelf life of at least three to six months to enable beneficiary countries to have enough time to plan and execute a rollout before they expire. We have more on this report. John Nkenga Song, director of the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on Thursday, said that 2.8 million doses of vaccine have expired on the continent, roughly 0.5% of the accumulated 572 million doses donated so far. Nkenga Song told a news briefing on Thursday that in terms of the 0.5%, any dose of vaccine that expired pains him because that is a life that can be potentially saved. Last week, Uganda, for instance, announced plans to destroy 400,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines, which were meant to be utilized in a mass vaccination exercise due to the same reason. In December last year, Nigeria also destroyed over 1 million expired doses of AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines. In a separate briefing, the World Health Organization Regional Director for Africa, Machidi Somoweti, echoed Nkenga Song's call. Nkenga Song explained that the expired doses are usually among those donated by individual countries or via the global vaccine sharing scheme COVAX, which arrives with very short notice. In contrast, doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine acquired by African countries via a scheme organized by the 55-member African Union and delivered with a long shelf life had not expired. Thank you so much, reporter. Moving on in our sports news today, following the completion of all the group stages at the AFCON 2021 in Cameroon, the boys have been sieved from the men as the round of 16 stage comes knocking. Now the final 16 countries that remained in the competition were all determined. 
Burkina Faso will face Gabon on Sunday 23rd January 2021 in a contest of two West African countries. On the same day, three-time champions Nigeria, who were champions in 1980, 1994 and 2003, shall face the 1994 Afghan hosts Tunisia. On Monday 24th January 2022, Guinea players debutants The Gambia and hosts Cameroon shall lock horns with another debutant Comoros on the same day. The next set of matches comes on Tuesday 25th January 2022. Senegal face Cape Verde before Morocco squares up with Malawi. The final two games at the round of 16 will see Ivory Coast up against seven times winners Egypt on Wednesday 26th January 2022. Another all-West African affair will see Mali play Equatorial Guinea. Well, thank you so much for being a little audience from where we started from. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We shall keep giving you the updates. It is TV Africa, the right to know.